Well, we are finishing this morning our series, uh, Go With Me, focused on the book of 2 Timothy. And of course, I was with you last week in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And to recap that for all of us who are here, as well as for those who weren't, Paul is writing to his spiritual son, Timothy, throughout 1 and 2 Timothy, these books. But particularly last week in 2 Timothy 3, we saw Paul writing to Timothy and saying this, but realize this, in the last days, difficult times will come. So he's appointing ahead to a time, literally 2,000 years ago, he looked ahead and said, there are times coming in the last days in which it will be difficult for followers of Jesus to live out their faith and more importantly, represent Christ well in so doing. He said to believers throughout 2 Timothy 3 then, in order to navigate those times, he said, it's gonna be difficult for us as Christians to follow or affirm biblical teaching to represent Christ well, to remain patient when it looks like evil is being rewarded. Now, he's defining these as the last days, but he's not just throwing out this idea that there's a last days coming, but he actually defines it by the people you will see in those last days. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, he lists 19 types of people, 19 descriptors for people in the last days. See if this doesn't sound like it. Why? Why will it be difficult for Christians to walk in those days to affirm their faith, represent Christ well, to remain patient? when it looks like evil is winning, because in those days, people will be, he says, lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, slanderers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, and on he goes. Among other things, Paul describes in chapter three that these people are like this because as he said, they are weighted down with sin. The word in the Greek means they have a heap of sin in their life, missing the mark outside of the word of God, doing their own thing, lovers of self, boastful, et cetera. He said they are led on by their own impulses is the English word, but really in the Greek, it's the word lust. Now, lust is a legitimate desire fulfilled in illegitimate ways. And lust, we typically think as sexual, but there's a lust for power. There's a lust for money. There's a lust for position. And so people in these last times, he says, are weighted down with sin. They're chasing after their own passions, their own lusts. Uh, The implication is outside of those for the uh, the will of God and for their lives. And they are short-sighted in so doing and ultimately foolish. As we saw last week, he's comparing foolishness with wisdom. Wisdom is to root and anchor yourself in the truth of God and God's word. But foolishness is to go outside of that. And so these people who are lovers of self and money and boastful and arrogant, those people living in the last days, sounds like our times, doesn't it? He said they're like that because they got a heap of sin in their life. They're led on by various self-centered, self-ish desires and lusts, legitimate needs, but seeking to fulfill them in illegitimate ways. And they're short-sighted and foolish for doing so. In spite of that, and the fact that it's gonna be difficult for believers to walk, work, worship, to represent Christ well in the difficult days of the last times, he encourages Timothy, but be assured, chapter three, verse nine, that these people will not make further progress for their foolishness in time will become obvious to all. So while it may seem that evil is winning, it won't be for long. Ultimately, the truth of God will be exposed and they will be, their living, their truth, so to speak, will be exposed as foolishness. Now, how then should we walk in these last days? In the difficult times of these days, how then should Christ followers live? Well, in chapter three, he says, number one, we need to avoid those foolish people, that foolish talk and their truth. Just avoid it. Number two, seek out and follow sound biblical teachers and teaching. Root yourself in the word of God ultimately and remain steadfast, number three, convinced of those things which you have learned and understood from the word of God. These are three ways in chapter three, he says that we as Christ followers can navigate difficult times. Why he concludes that chapter, verses 16 and 17, he says, because all of scripture is inspired by God. It's come out of his mouth. It's been breathed out of his mouth. And that scripture is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training 
in righteousness. Why? So that the man or woman of God may be equipped for every good work, equipped to navigate difficult times, equipped to find life, not lose it by chasing wisdom, not foolishness. This is the teaching of Paul to his young protege, his son in the faith, as we talked about from 2 Timothy chapter 3 uh, last week. And I couldn't help uh, thinking about this this past week because, of, as you know, the eyes of the world in so many ways were focused on the tragedy at sea concerning that Titan, that submersible that imploded, went down. And I think the world is fascinated by the Titanic we are. And so uh, we were captured by that 24-7 news cycles, all talking about that. But in light of what we studied last week, in light of what I've just recapped, and without trying to make light of or leverage tragedy, I couldn't help notice this quote by Stockton Rush, who was the former CEO of OceanGate, one of the five who died on that Titan, who was the pilot, if you will, the owner in a sense. And in one of the interviews a long time ago, prior to all of this, he said this, look at this quote, you know, at some point, safety just is pure waste. I think I can do this just as safely by breaking the rules. No, you can't. I'm here to tell you, no, you can't. You can't live safely. You can't break the rules. That is the word. You can't just do whatever you want and somehow survive, live, find your way. From time immemorial, people have tried to walk their own path away from the path of God, and it never works out. The foolishness, as Paul said, in time is revealed. And again, not to make light of the tragedy uh, of the loss of life and all of this and but I couldn't help but see this quote and think, oh my gosh, that is exactly what Timothy, or Paul was talking about to Timothy. The word of God is what is sure. The word of God is wisdom. And the further away from that you get, the more foolish you become and you risk your life in so many ways, physical life, mental, emotional, relational, spiritual, eternal. The further away you get, the more you're at risk. You cannot break the rules and the rules of God. By the way, if you weren't here last week, I began my message with a, uh, a chart of, a, uh, of all the different parts of a grill that my wife Linda had given me a few years ago for Father's Day. I finally got around to putting it together. But I, I talked about that because every appliance, a grill, your car, a computer, owners, creator, create those things. And they always supply with them an owner's manual. Always. And if an owner's manual to a computer says, don't push these three buttons in sequence or you'll lose your hard drive, we would call you foolish if you did that. Why did you do that? The owner's manual says right there, don't push this button, this button, this button, or you'll lose your hard drive. And you did it and we'd say, didn't you read? How foolish you were. Well, see, God is the creator of all life, isn't he? And with life came an owner's manual called the Bible. And that is the owner's manual given to us by the creator of life. And he says, follow this and you will live. Get outside of it and you will die. You can't live safely by breaking the rules. You can't live apart from the word of God and from his truth. Not really. You can breathe, but you may not be fully alive. So this morning, as we finish up and turn our attention to 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, I want you to remember that there's no, there's no chapter divisions in the Bible. There's no verses. When the authors wrote, like for instance, in this case, when Paul is writing to Timothy, it's just a letter. You don't put chapters and verses in a letter you might write to a friend or a spouse. So remember that. That's all human, uh, added later by humans to help us find verses and all of that, navigate it. But my point in that is as we turn the page to what we call 2 Timothy chapter 4, this is a continuation as you're going to see. Paul's still in that same frame of mind and reference. He's considering, he's thinking about the last days. He's thinking about the difficulty that believers will face because of the people around him, because of the times, how they navigate. All of that remains on his mind as we turn to chapter 4 verse 1. So take a look what he says. He says this, I solemnly there exhort you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. Now remember the verses before this was all scriptures inspired by God, profitable for teaching, reproof, man, a woman of God, equipped for every good work. So therefore, with that in mind, 
I am exhorting you in the presence of God. In Christ, he says, looking ahead, see how he's looking ahead. Someday, Christ will appear. Someday, his kingdom will come. And each one of us will stand before him. That truth will be revealed. What do you want it to look like? How will it go down for you? in that moment. All of this is on his mind. And by the way, not just the appearing of Christ, the coming of his kingdom, but even later on in this chapter, Paul sees his own end coming. This is towards the end of his life in prison, etc. So he's looking ahead to his own end as well as to the last days. And so he's giving instruction again to Timothy. So he says this, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. He says, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season to correct, to rebuke, and to exhort with great patience and instruction. Now, the word for preach here, and, and it's really important that we understand this. Typically in English, when we talk about a preach, uh, to preach or preachers, you might be thinking, let's say of someone like me in a moment like now, up in front at a pulpit on a stage, preaching a message uh, to Jesus, to others who are just sitting and listening. But the point is, that's not really what the Greek word means. It ultimately means proclaiming the truth of God in a way uh, that, uh, about matters, I should say, that pertain to the gospel, the hope, the truth of God's mercy, grace, love, forgiveness. Proclaiming the truth of God, proclaiming the gospel. And preaching, as we say, me standing here, if you will, in the pulpit, speaking, that is a way to proclaim the good news and hope of Jesus. But it's not the only way. And all of us have been given a ministry, as we'll see in a moment, to be constantly proclaiming the hope, the good news of Jesus in one way or another. How we speak, how we interact with others, the way we live our lives. It's all contained in this word, which ultimately has to do with representing Jesus well. Representing Jesus well. Now, look what he says related to this. Uh, He says that, we must do this towards the end of this verse. When we proclaim God's truth in word, deed, the way we live our lives, etc., he says, we're gonna have to do that with great patience and instruction. We're gonna have to do that in season and out of season. By the way, that idiom uh, to Greeks or to Hebrew language, the idea of in season or out of season means whether it's convenient or not. Whether it's convenient or not, you and I, must be ready at all times to proclaim in word and deed the hope of gospel truth, the truth of God's word, in a way to represent Christ well and draw the other to him, not actually to repel others from him. And he says, whether it's convenient or not, doesn't mean like, well, I've got the time to share or not. Of course, that's one way of convenience. But look, when we're proclaiming the word of God in one way or another, again, um, that comes often as a cost. Whether it's convenient to my relationship with someone, mentally, emotionally, there's all kinds of ways that I might be inconvenienced in a moment by trying to represent Jesus well. And he says, whatever the moment is, whether it's convenient to you or not convenient to you, you need to recognize your role, your job, as you look ahead to the end times, to his appearing, to his judgment standing before him, is ultimately to represent him well. And it says here in this verse, with patience and instruction. Now, the idea of patience, of course, uh, is that if I plant an apple seed in the ground today, I don't need apples tomorrow, right? Two laws of sowing and reaping, Galatians chapter 6 Verses seven and eight, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. The two laws are this, you reap what you sow, but in a different season than you sow it. So often in America today, whether on on every front from political to spiritual, whatever, it's just fight, 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 demand, demand at the moment without patience. Sometimes we see people uh, living foolish lives, if you will, according to the word of God. We know the way they're living will lead, in a sense, to demise. To It's unsafe, it's, it's not good, and we care for them, we love them. They might be family members. And we want them right now to receive that word, to receive that correction, to be drawn near to the word of God. But we, but we have to, in proclaiming that, Remember, we're sowing seeds for the future. You may not see the fruit in the moment and you're gonna have to exercise great patience 
as you wait and trust God, do your part and trust God to do in their lives what you can't do yourself. Not only that, but we're gonna to have to be wise. Instruction is understand how to do that. You know, there's a phrase that's been around for a number of years in our country, speak truth to power, right? You've probably heard this phrase. When I'm talking with my progressive friends around the country, I said, I'm not very interested in, in speaking truth to power because for every action, there's a reaction. And what America values in the moment is speaking. But see, I'm not so interested in speaking truth to power. I want to learn to understand, to be instructed in the ways of learning how to bend the ear of power to the truth I speak. You see, if I just speak, I say this, you say that, it's clash. For every action, there's a reaction. Shouldn't the goal be to try to win others to your understanding, to your point of view, ultimately to the truth of God? Isn't that what it's about? So I'm not just interested in speaking, I want the spoken word of truth to be received. I want someone to hear what I'm saying, to, to adjust, to understand, and move towards the truth I'm speaking. I just don't want to speak, but America just values the speaking, and that's why we got this, for every action, a reaction. Instruction with patience understands how do we navigate nuance. Sometimes speaking is staying silent letting your actions speak louder than your words. There's all kinds of ways to speak. Some march in the streets, God bless you. Some write, some pray. It's all responsive. It's all about proclaiming hope, truth, the gospel. But the idea is we need to, with patience, whether it's convenient or not, learn how to bend the ear of others to the truth we speak by exercising great wisdom, understanding, instruction. So with all that in mind, then, uh, he has in this passage uh, three ways to do that. That is, the speaking of truth, it, it, you can count on it, 2 Timothy 3, 16 uh, and 17, because he says this, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, to three things. Number one, correct. Now, in the Greek, this word, uh, when I think of correct, I got to correct you, right? I got to correct you, almost like a parent or a teacher in that sense. But really, it has to do with countering falsehood. So first, as I do my best to represent Christ well in difficult times, to proclaim truth, to draw others to it, not repel them from it, the word of God can be counted on. And part of my calling in proclaiming the truth, the hope of the gospel is to provide a counter to falsehoods, to speak not my truth, but his truth. So when I hear, when I see falsehood in one way or another, right? Action, deed, whatever, I do want to counter falsehoods. I wanna make sure the truth is out there. And with that comes this idea, the truth is good. The truth anchors you. The truth provides you safety. So it's not just, hey, I wanna correct you, right? No, it's this idea of countering falsehood with truth that points people to hope, number one. Number two, he says then, rebuke. Now, again, if I read an English rebuke, I'm thinking about a parent or a child or, you know, a parent to a child, teacher, I'm rebuking you. Uh, that sounds so harsh. In the Greek, the idea has to do with warning, warning of danger. Someone says, I wanna go outside the rules. Number one, don't go outside the rules. Here's the truth of what the rules are. They're meant not to, to squelch your fun, but to give you life. But let me, number two, warn you, if you do break the rules, if you do go outside of this, there's great danger, there's harm. You could lose your life. So putting the truth out there to counter falsehoods with the thought, the hope, don't you see this will lead to life? That's the idea of correction. Rebuke is this idea on the negative side. Let me warn you, if you violate the scripture, if you go outside of that into foolishness away from wisdom, it can come and often will come at a great cost. So let me warn you. And then he says, number three, uh, to exhort. Now, again, this word exhort is, is really a good English word. It's beyond encouragement. And I put that there for you uh, to come alongside. In the Greek, this word for exhort has to do, it's actually parakaleo, it's two words. Kaleo has to do with calling, right? And, and the para is to come alongside. The paraclete is the name in the Greek for the Holy Spirit. 
right? So the paraclete, the one who comes alongside you to encourage you to keep faith and hope alive, to spur you on to love and good deeds. This is the paraclete, the Holy Spirit who comes alongside us. Jesus says, when I go away, don't worry, I'm sending to you the paraclete, one who I have called to come alongside you, to help you navigate your life these times, to find your way to wisdom and life away from foolishness and death. So this is the word here used for exhort. And so think about it. In countering falsehoods, I'm putting out the truth of God with hope. I'm also warning people, look, here's the positive, but the negative is this, let me warn you. And I'll tell you what, bro, we can do this. We can do this. We can come alongside the word of God. Let's come alongside one another and let's walk in this truth. Let's work it out together. We can do this, bro. That's what is being uh, shared by Paul with Timothy here in this passage. So as he continues on, verses three and four, he says this, for the time will come when they, who is they? That's those people, the 19 to scriptures, the lovers of self, haters of good, brutal, treacherous, right? Disobedient to parents. The people he discussed in 2 Timothy 3, one through five, the time will come when they will not tolerate sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, the word is lust, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. Now in English, you don't quite pick this up, but it's there, Hear the word, see the word sound, hear the word ears. Several times in this passage, this word, this audible, there's an audible metaphor, there's an audio, what we're hearing and who we're listening to, it's all embedded in this passage. So breaking this down, he said that these people in the last days defined in 2 Timothy 3, one through five, it says, first, they will not tolerate sound doctrine. And the word in the Greek for sound is the word, uh, it is used at times of Christians whose opinions are free from any mixture of error. In other words, it's solid truth. You can count on it, right? So they will turn away from what can be counted on what is free from bias, what is free from agenda, the unadulterated truth of the word of God. In the last days, these type of people, it says there will come a time when they will not tolerate that sound, firm, doctrinal truth. They just won't tolerate it, want anything to do with it. But rather, he says, wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, their own lust. Now, literally, I was thinking about this. How does this translate to our understanding of these last times that we're in and how people live today? Think about it. In this passage embedded this auditory uh, deal, uh, basically these are people who are siloing themselves in echo chambers. That's how we would say it today, right? They can't, they won't tolerate sound instruction. So rather they seek out to surround themselves with people who look like them, think like them, talk like them, act like them. And they wanna create for themselves a silo, a safe space. They get in silos and, and, and in that, they only want, they, they want their ears tickled. They wanna be happy with what they hear. They don't wanna be sad by what they wanna hear. They wanna be happy with what they hear. And the only way to do that is to move away from sound doctrine and to surround yourselves, get in echo chambers where everybody's saying the same thing. Everybody's thinking alike and it all sounds then like truth. Paul's looking ahead. I can't even believe it, honestly. I mean, 2000 years ago, describing the times we're living in. These people then silo themselves in echo chambers, watching, listening to, associating with only people who think, speak and act as they do. And they do that because they don't want anything to do with the sound doctrine because they want to create their own rules. They want to move outside of the creator of all his life's owner's manual and create themselves their own owner's manual. And so this becomes the antithesis when their way is actually the antithesis of the truth. They flip the script and they silo themselves in echo chambers with other people who talk, think, and act like them to affirm their foolishness. And then in verse four, or I'm sorry, this is a continuation in the same passage. He says this, in those days, they will turn away from the truth, meaning God's truth. They don't, they won't wanna hear it. And ultimately instead, they turn aside 
to embrace myths. And the Greek, this is where we get the word from, myths. It's a direct, it's mythos. It's the same exact word in the English as in the Greek. So these people turning away from sound truth, creating their own truth, echo chambers, etc., they will turn aside from the truth of God's word to myths. Now, again, thinking about it for our times, what does that mean? To their own narratives, to their own truth, my truth, to falsehoods that directly contradict the owner's manual, the way and will of God for us to live, and ultimately to conspiracy theories. Think about it. Rather than just take a look at the sound, unadulterated doctrine, they'll turn aside and believe conspiracies. You know what I'm saying? Like myths, they make it up and act like it's true. Paul sees all this 2,000 years ago. Sound like the days we're living in? So verse five, he says this, but as for you, that is Christ followers, seeking to navigate difficult times, anchored in the word of God, not perfect by any means, but stumbling and falling, receiving grace, mercy, forgiveness, getting back up to try again and returning to that set way and that path. He says this, but as of you, as you proclaim this truth in word and deed through your life, he says, number one, use self-restraint. Remember I was talking about speaking truth to power, bending the ear of power. See, speaking involves self-restraint. I gotta know, I gotta navigate the moment, the season. I gotta think with patience and instruction, understanding. So I'm gonna have to exercise self-restraint in proclaiming truth. And in all things, that is word and deed, I'm gonna have to endure the hardships that inevitably come with proclaiming God's truth, with trying to live for Christ in an age that people are living for themselves. Hardships are gonna come with that territory. I'm gonna have to exercise self-restraint, endure those hardships to do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Now, these are words directly written to Timothy, but again, we shouldn't think that they were only written to Timothy. They were specifically, but generally 2,000 years later and even to the churches in that time, they were reading, this comes down to us. Now, you or I might not call ourselves evangelists in kind of the 20th century way where Billy Graham's an evangelist and he stands up and he proclaims the gospel and people come forward and receive Jesus as their savior. But evangelism just means proclamation of good news. And in that, all of us are called to be evangelists. Matthew 28, uh, go into all the world, make disciples. Every single one of us is called to that. Some do it professionally, if you will, vocationally. Others uh, just by living their lives as teachers and, and doctors and, 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 and people that work in hotels and clean up and all kinds of ways. If we are Christ followers, we are called wherever we are in season or out of season to be about proclaiming the good news of Jesus or the gospel. And so all of us have this as our ministry. And that's what's important to understand here. In fact, take a look at, at this uh, Next slide, because I want, as I've thought about all of this, I'm thinking, how do we translate that for our times? What is all of this saying to us? A little bit uh, smaller for you to read, but let me read it for you. It says this, individually and collectively then, and in, in, in some, we have been called to represent Jesus well. That's it. You and I, individually, us collectively as a church, are called in these difficult days to represent Jesus well at all times in word and deed. Why? So that others will be drawn closer to and not driven further away from him because of or after our interaction with them. That's what all this is about. How do you as an individual, how do we collectively continue, do our best to represent the hope, the love, the faith, the peace, the life, that comes with following Jesus. So that others are compelled. We learn to bend the ear of others, the hearts of others, to move away from foolishness and to move to the center of the truth of God's word so that they will find life and not death. In our role to fulfill our ministry as evangelists, if you will, to be proclaimers of goodness and of hope and of truth, the way we live, the way we speak, ultimately through interaction with others, one way or another, are we moving people closer to Jesus through our interaction or after the interaction, are they uh, pushed further away? I know we've all heard it, right? Christians, are you kidding me? I don't want anything to do with the church. See, that's, that's this. 
And boy, as a church, as individuals right now trying to do our best to follow Jesus, we're in a hole right now in America, aren't we? Remember we talked about that in the He Gets Us series. Some 86% of U.S. adults in America have a favorable view of Jesus, but only 11% of Christians in the church. We're in a deep hole. And how do we climb out of it? By applying the wisdom of Paul spoken to Timothy in our own individual lives from moment to moment and then collectively as a church, representing Jesus well, like we do through Vine and Village and many other things here in this church. So Paul, moving towards conclusion of this section, he says this, uh, or in fact, let me back up and say, when you think about this, he's already talked in scripture in 2 Corinthians, next slide, please, uh, about this. And he says, all of this, that is all of this, um, this idea of representing Christ well has come from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. Now stop right there. He's saying all of this, this charge, this challenge to represent Christ well and to be proclaimers of hope and of truth, this has come from God. Why? Because first, God, I have been reconciled to God through faith in Jesus. Christ made a way that I, Mark Damas, could be reconciled to him through faith in Jesus Christ, okay? Since I've been reconciled then, this has come from God. He's tasked me to go out and to be a reconciler of others. Matthew 5, 9 says, a peacemaker. Do you know in the Beatitudes of Matthew chapter five, every Beatitude, you get something for what you do, but there's only one Beatitude in which you're identified with someone for what you do. And that's Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. So in this passage, he's saying, since you, Mark Damas, have been reconciled, you have a mission as well to go out and to be a reconciler, uh, uh, bringing others in the world to Jesus himself. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. So not only has he given me a ministry of service to go out and be a reconciler, to see myself that way, but I've been given this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal to others through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to the truth of scripture, be reconciled to God. That's our role. You know, we spoke uh, several months ago about uh, ambassadors. When you're an ambassador, if you're an ambassador for the United States living in France, you don't get to say what you want to say. You got to speak on behalf of the American government, particularly Joe Biden, the president of the United States at the moment. That's what you, you don't get to say what you want because you are his or our government's ambassador. You're not your own voice. I imagine if you're an ambassador, you go out and speak your own truth. You won't be the ambassador anymore. Right? And ambassadors live in embassies or they live around, they work in the embassies, right? So maybe in France, I don't know what town it is in, you got an American embassy. And when people, geographically, that land is in France, let's say. But by international law, technically that land belongs to America. So when you set foot on embassy soil, legally, international law, you have set foot in America and you're on American soil. And that's why the embassy should look and feel and everything you see in the colors and the flags, it's all America. See, the embassy is to reflect America in a foreign country. That's the church. Revelation 7, 9, every nation, tribe, people, and tongue, walking, working, worshiping God together as one forever. Do people feel like that when they sit foot at 72204, 6221 Colonel Glenn, they walk in this door. Does this place feel like heaven? Do we represent heaven well as an embassy? Do you and I as ambassadors speak on behalf of the king, not our own words? Boy, in our day, that takes self-restraint, doesn't it? There is so much stuff I wanna say, trust me. <laughs> on my Twitter feed, on my Facebook, on my Instagram, and the, there is so much I wanna say, stuff that just drives me nuts. But I exercise, do my best to exercise self-restraint. Because at the end of the day, my job is to, in a sense, to fix the country. If I wanted to do that, go be a politician, go run for a pre No, I've chosen to walk with Jesus and try to represent him well with a ministry and message of reconciliation. I don't want anything to detract from that because I want to draw people. I don't care if you're Democrat, Republican, Black, whatever you are, right? I want your interaction with me 
and I know you want this, and I know we want this for our church. I want the interaction you have with us to not in any way detract or to polarize or push you away from the truth of God's love for you, the truth of God's word. So I have to exercise self-restraint. I have to navigate nuance. I have to work and speak and act with understanding, and I have to go chase it because it doesn't come naturally. So all that's to say as he closes up again this section, look what he says. We're gonna have to exercise, as I just mentioned, great patience if we're gonna represent Christ well in difficult times. We have to use that self-restraint and we're going to have to suffer through and endure the various hardships that inevitably come with, uh, that are inevitably, I should say, associated uh, with doing so. That is seeking to represent Christ well and not yourself. And as Paul then moves and turns from this teaching to his own life, look what he says. I know a little thing about this, he says. Chapter four, verses six through eight, he says this, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. My time's come and gone. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. In the future, there is reserved for me, he says, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to also to all those who have loved his appearing. To all those who've done like me, to try to represent him well, to be someone who draws people to truth and to love and to God, not further alienate them into foolishness, to find wisdom. He's looking ahead to the future, to the coming of Jesus. And he says, I fought the good fight. Not so much a fight, it's just a fight to stay engaged because we're all sinners, right? Or maybe I'm the only one in the room. But I've had to fight myself because I so often want and have gone this way. But I have to fight to correct my mind and my heart and ask forgiveness when I sin and get myself back on the solid word of God. I gotta fight. And Paul says, I've done that. He says, I've kept the faith. Again, not perfectly, but I've, I've kept on going. I've, I kept believing, I kept getting up and I kept going. And he says, I finished my course. And someday, isn't that what you want for your life? When you lay and take your last breath, surrounded maybe by family or children or close friends, to be able to look them in the eye and say, man, I, wasn't perfect, but I fought for that faith. I've kept believing, right? And now I've finished my course. And I have hope that when I stand before Jesus, I will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You know, Jesus doesn't say that to you because you lived a perfect life. You, he says that to you because he lived a perfect life. And you have fought the good fight, finished the course and done your best to keep the faith and to proclaim the good news and the gospel hope of his love for all people, not just some. Well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, the truth that gives us a roadmap, an owner's manual to navigate these difficult days, mindful that our primary mission is to represent you well so that others can come to know you as we do. In Jesus' name, amen.